reason that the world has to sit by and watch a million African children die from malaria. There are now 30-some new diseases that we had never seen before. You know, not something that had been going on forever. This is new. The microbes know no boundaries, and there is no risk so remote that it can't affect us here. Despite the advances of medical science, our world is still haunted by the specter of dangerous disease. The illness came on really quickly. We were in the mountains on Monday, and by Thursday, he was on life support. Rx for Survival is the story of the greatest challenges in global health today, and of the people who are meeting them head on. This is a war. This is the ammunition for the war. One of global health's best weapons is one of the oldest. Roll up your sleeve. Vaccines to protect children from epidemic killers have been around for centuries. This will only hurt a little. I can still do the job today. But the challenge is huge. Dr. Sudeep Singh and his team need to vaccinate 165 million children in less than a week. Antibiotics also continue to save lives, as Dr. Jim Kim knows too well. We had to go and convince them, please, you need to continue taking your medicines, because if you don't, you're going to die. An ophthalmologist from Baltimore discovered that two drops of vitamin A can mean the difference between life and death for millions of children around the world. Wherever there is creativity and commitment, the landscape of global health is changing. The bottom line is, we can do this. We know how to save lives, and there's no reason for us not to. Tonight, we begin our journey with vaccines, global health's most powerful weapons in the struggle against disease. But how long will they continue to protect us with the arrival of new killers? And can we find ways to get vaccines to everyone who needs them? Disease Warriors, coming next on Rx for Survival. funding for Rx for Survival was provided by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, working to ensure that life-saving advances in health reach those who need them most. And by... If you ran a drug company, what would you change? I would try to prevent disease, not just treat it. I would go after the really tough diseases. I'd make it so folks wouldn't have to choose between their groceries and their medicine. At Merck, we believe in the same things you do. Because 50 years ago, George Merck told us to put patients first by creating novel medicines and vaccines and getting them to the people who need them. I would try to see everything through the eyes of a patient. Merck, where patients come first. Polio vaccine packed in ice, safe for several days, is being distributed to thousands of vaccinators in northern India. This is the largest public health campaign in the world today. A last-ditch effort to eradicate polio from the face of the planet. This is a war against polio. This is the ammunition for the war. And these are the casualties of this war, which has been waged worldwide for over a decade. And the final battle will hopefully be in India, one of the last remaining reservoirs of this relentless crippler. The Indian campaign will target 165 million children, a daunting task, especially in crowded North Indian cities like Aligarh. Something like 300 this time. Nason Saba and Sudeep Singh, a local Sikh doctor, are in charge of this densely populated region. The polio eradication program is the largest public health initiative in the history of humanity. It is huge. But the question is, will it work? Ten years ago, there were 175,000 polio cases a year in India. Now, there are fewer than 100. 
But the speed at which polio virus spreads can quickly turn scores of cases into thousands overnight. So vaccinators have to outrace the virus. We need to get immunity levels to such a height that the virus no longer has a human host. The polio virus, like any virus, is just a few strands of genetic material wrapped in protein. Unable to live on its own, it invades other cells to survive. In some cases, the virus enters the spinal cord, causing nerve damage and paralysis. Most people only get a cold. But in everyone, the virus lives in the human gut and then spreads in human feces. If excrement with polio virus reaches these unhygienic open sewers, it can spark a larger outbreak in an instant. If you really want to put a face to uh, polio transmission, this is it. Yeah. All the drain water from these sewage is coming here. The hand pump picks it up, and that water is being used as drinking water. And so the infection spreads. Fortunately, most children who catch the virus don't get sick with the disease. Unfortunately, they can still spread it to others. For the 100 cases of paralysis in India today, there are 20,000 more children quietly spreading the disease all over the country. If we leave a single child out, we jeopardize the entire program, not only for the state, but for the entire world. Really, it's that serious. But as organizers begin mobilizing millions throughout India for the vaccination campaign, there are major obstacles to its success. Muslim religious leaders in Aligarh mistakenly believe that the polio vaccine causes impotence, and they warn people of their faith not to take it. And this is the result. Paralyzed children. They came here to the village about four to five months ago to give the vaccine, and nine children died. When the same polio vaccinators came back the next time, we all batted them and sent them away. After that, the belief was spread. But nine children hadn't died. The rumors were false. And now this rickshaw driver, who believed the stories, carries a son who will be crippled for life. That is one. We've had cases when villagers have thrown bricks. They have actually shot people. With house-to-house -house visits, Nason Saba and his team of vaccinators are determined to win over religious resistors and prevent more children from being struck down. Namaskar ji. But it will not be easy. We don't want the vaccines at all. Are you God? Answer me. We only trust God. Hey, please listen to me. There's no one bigger than Allah. Am I right or wrong? If the vaccinators can't break this cultural resistance, the polio virus will live on here in India, and the great campaign will fail. Allah keeps my child safe. Who are you to keep him safe? The arguments in the simple courtyard in India are not new. Before there were vaccines or medicines of any sort, faith in God was about the only thing people had to ward off disease. Illness is not divine punishment or miasma of bad air or, as some still believe, an imbalance of bodily humor. Until 1864, when a brilliant French chemist, Louis Pasteur, unmasked the real causes of human illness. No, ladies and gentlemen, illness is caused by tiny germs, living organisms in the air all around us, so small you cannot see them, yet so dangerous they can kill you. And how did you discover these germs? <laughs> uh, I will show you. Francois. Working with the latest microscopes of his day, Pasteur was able to visualize microorganisms, like bacteria, for the first time. These particular germs cause cholera. I found them in the blood of an infected chicken. And these tiny little germs, just like these, that could make us sick. They will even cause some of us in this room to die. But, Monsieur Pasteur, how do we kill them before they kill us? Uh, that is indeed the question for which I have no answers yet. But uh, I do have some ideas. 
Pasteur is keenly aware of experiments performed by an English country physician who in 1796 became convinced that he had found a way to prevent one of the world's deadliest diseases. The physician's name was Edward Jenner. And the disease was smallpox. Jenner noticed that the faces of milkmaids in his parish never showed the telltale scars of smallpox. Yet their hands were often covered with sores from cowpox, a similar but much milder form of smallpox. Yes, perhaps if I can see that. Yes. A daisy, a moment of your time. Come and meet the good doctor. I'd just like to see your hands. Since none of the maids ever got smallpox, Jenner began to wonder if catching cowpox somehow made one immune to smallpox. Yes, that's excellent. So he devised a dangerous plan to see if he was right. James, come in. Come along, Master Phipps. Now, if you roll up your sleeve. Jenner took pus from the cowpox scars of the milkmaid and scraped it into an incision made in young James Phipps. This will only hurt a little, and you're a brave boy, I know. This gave Phipps a harmless case of cowpox. All done. But there was only one way to find out if the boy was now immune to smallpox. Despite the grave risks and questionable ethics, two weeks later, Jenner exposed Phipps to a smallpox victim and waited for the results. Fortunately for everyone, Jenner's theory was correct. James Phipps survived, and like the milkmaids, he never got smallpox. James! Cowpox had given him immunity. Something for you, my boy. Jenner called his discovery a vaccine from the Latin word vaccinia, the medical term for cowpox. Most people were too frightened to try Jenner's revolutionary vaccine, but those who knew of its protective power did. Although no one, not even Jenner, had a clue as to why it actually worked. But almost a century later, Louis Pasteur is determined to find out. He knows cowpox is a weak form of smallpox that can prevent the more harmful disease. If this is a principle for disease prevention, it should work for other germs as well. Pasteur begins testing his theory on animals and successfully makes a vaccine for chicken cholera. But he wishes to go down in history as a saver of human life. So he decides to take on one of the deadliest diseases in the world rabies rabies was and still is an incurable disease caused by a virus a germ too small for Pasteur to see but he knows it's there using the spinal cords of infected rabbits Pasteur tries to produce a milder form of rabies for a vaccine but before he can complete the experiment Events force his hand. A young boy, Joseph Meister, has been bitten by a rabies-infected dog. In a week, he will likely be dead. I don't know what to say, but I think it's worth a try. Uh, yes, all right. But Pasteur doesn't know if his experimental vaccine will kill the boy or save him. He writes about this defining moment in his memoirs. Joseph Meister would almost inevitably come down with rabies. As the death of the child appeared certain, I decided, not without deep and severe unease, to try the procedure. Pasteur is not a physician, so he asked the doctor to do the injection. You're going to have to do it. You have to go in the stomach. <laughs> Ah! 
Two weeks later, Pasteur receives a letter. Dear Monsieur Pasteur, I am feeling good and sleep well, and I have a good appetite. Yours sincerely, Joseph Meister. Bonsoir. This breakthrough had a significance far beyond a cure for rabies. Now the human race had a scientifically proven weapon in the war against infectious disease. But ironically, Pasteur, like Jenner before him, couldn't explain how the great discovery worked. Only in the 20th century did scientists finally understand what Jenner and Pasteur had given them. Vaccines can't kill germs the way antibiotics kill bacteria, but they can recruit the body's own defenses to help ward off viruses. When virus used in a vaccine enters the body, the immune system summons two defenders. Antibody proteins mold themselves to the virus to keep it from invading cells. And if a virus does get into a cell, the body sends out another defender, killer T cells that destroy the invaded cell as well as the virus trapped inside. Because the vaccine contains weak virus, the immune system easily wins. And now these tailor-made antibodies and killer T cells stand guard in the bloodstream, ready to defeat the stronger disease virus should it ever strike. With the development of vaccines for diseases like diphtheria, mumps, and measles, old viral epidemics began to disappear. When Jonas Salk produced an injectable polio vaccine, and Albert Sabin made an oral version. Many countries organized massive vaccination campaigns that brought this relentless crippler to the brink of eradication. Vaccines were winning the war against viruses in the West. But in poorer countries, most viral diseases still flourished. Even smallpox, the first illness to have a vaccine, continued to claim more lives than any other disease in history. It killed without mercy, bringing a mask of agony to the faces of the dying. And I remember seeing children with their faces swollen with hemorrhagic smallpox and thinking, isn't this a shame that it's the last view the parents will have of this child? We had a huge hospital ward filled with smallpox cases. And as you walk past the beds, these people looked so distressed. And you could identify at least half of them who were going to die. A young British physician just put his hands on the balcony rail outside and said, I cannot again do rounds on a smallpox ward. In 1967, the World Health Organization decided to mount a global vaccination campaign to wipe out smallpox forever. But the disease was so widespread, experts predicted total eradication was doomed to failure. Even its leader was skeptical. It was such an overwhelming problem. There was a time where we really had our doubts that we were going to be able to succeed. For the mammoth task, Henderson recruited young idealists who immediately became known as the smallpox warriors. Later, many would rise to prominent positions in the field of public health, but now they were just doing their job, which meant getting the vaccine to extremely remote places. A number of these had rather long hair. They certainly weren't individuals who were likely to show up and be well received at a, an embassy cocktail party, but they worked tirelessly. They were real heroes. And they needed courage because their task was truly daunting. But they were spirited and they had a vaccine that could be easily administered by scratching the skin with a special serum laden needle. Smallpox also had characteristics that gave Donald Henderson realistic hope he could break the chain of transmission. We always knew where it was. Wherever the virus was, 
the individuals had rash. And we could go into a village and immediately identify whether we've got a problem. And smallpox could only be transmitted from person to person. There was no animal or insect also carrying the virus. So immunizing as many people as possible could hopefully break the cycle of disease. At the start of the initiative in 1966, 63 countries were reporting smallpox cases. One of the hardest hit was Nigeria. So the warriors went there first. The plan was to vaccinate 80% of Nigeria's large and widely scattered population. They were relying on a concept called herd immunity, which means if enough of your neighbors are vaccinated, you're unlikely to get the disease. But they soon discovered that vaccinating even 80% of Nigerians was impossible. There were far too many people and not enough vaccine. We found ourselves looking for an alternative. How do we use the small amount of vaccine we have most efficiently. Bill Fagi, who directed the campaign in Nigeria, was forced to rely on a strategy called ring vaccination to keep the program alive. When they found a smallpox case, they'd vaccinate only those people in the immediate vicinity of the victim. These vaccination rings would still keep the disease from spreading, even though only 15% of the population would be vaccinated. But if the warriors missed cases outside the rings, all would be lost. The problem was how to locate everyone with smallpox. Bill Fagi turned to Nigeria's extensive network of missionaries for help. Lokoja Mission Station calling all parishes. Over. We divided up the geographic area and asked each missionary if they would send runners to every village to find out whether they had smallpox. If the runners found a case, vaccinators would quickly move in and place a quarantine ring around that village. Suddenly we were able to put a mark on every village with smallpox. The bottom line is that smallpox disappeared from this area in a period of weeks even though we had vaccinated only a minority of the population. They also latched onto another valuable group who could provide intelligence, school children. Is there anybody here that knows of someone that has this disease? By holding up a picture of smallpox and saying, has anyone seen this? We soon found that little boys in particular between nine and 13 years of age knew pretty much everything that was going on and were quite prepared to tell you all about it. Over there. Region after region began to fall to the strategy, with ring vaccination always the cornerstone of the plan. After three years of determined work, the smallpox campaign triumphed in West Africa. India, with the largest concentration of cases, became the next target for the warriors. But with its massive population, they would need other strategies for success. They recruited thousands of Indian workers to help them find cases. By 1973, they mounted a house-by-house -house campaign that was so well coordinated, they visited 100 million homes in just six days. But what they discovered alarmed them. In one state where we were getting about 500 cases a week, suddenly the searchers found 11,000 cases in this, just this one week. Uh, it was a very black day indeed. There were those who said, you'll never get rid of the smallpox in India. Worse, the disease could easily spread among such a highly mobile population. In the 1970s, 1% of the Indian population was on a train at any one time. And so you're thinking of millions of people moving around the state. To try to overcome this problem, they created surveillance and vaccination posts at train stations. And they stood watch at markets and other gathering places. There is a goddess by the name of Sitala Mata, 
in Hindu mythology to whom villagers would make offerings for her to heal them if they were ill with smallpox. It seemed that it'd be a good idea to post people at the Shitala Mata shrines to learn where smallpox cases were occurring. They also went into the countryside where farmers worked long hours in distant fields. To get them to come into the villages to be vaccinated, Fagi enlisted the help of a creative chief. He said, I'll get them back. And with that, he had his drummer begin pounding on a talking drum. People came flowing into the village almost as fast as people move by you. You can vaccinate them. After two hours, we finally finished everyone. I said, I am very impressed. How do you have such control over your people? He said, I told them on the talking drum to come to the village market if they wanted to see the tallest man in the world. And I guess I looked that way to him since I'm six foot seven inches. By 1975, after three years of hard work, India was smallpox free. This had been the hardest battle of all. The warriors could now smell victory. By 1977, the only cases being reported were in Somalia in East Africa, mostly among nomadic families who were hard to track down. Later that year, Two cases appeared in a group of nomads camped near the city of Mirka. The victims were children, and a smallpox volunteer, Ali Malmarla, was sent to bring them to the Mirka hospital. Ali himself had been vaccinated, so he didn't fear helping the children. By the time Ali reached them, one child was dying, but he helped the other survive and anyone who had contact with the children was vaccinated. So there were no more cases. But then the unthinkable happened. Ali Marlin himself came down with smallpox. Ali was immunized, but he didn't have a take. So the immunization was not successful, and as a result, he was unprotected. While Ali lay in bed fighting for his life, there were no other cases in Somalia or anywhere else in the world. Could the virus that had plagued millions for centuries finally be confined in just one human body in a remote hospital in Somalia? For weeks thereafter, we held our breath. When Ali Marlin finally emerged from the hospital, Little did he know that he would become the last victim of this terrible disease, the end point in a smallpox chain of person-to-person -person transmissions stretching back thousands of years. The warriors had won. I almost had the feeling like having been a soldier in a war, suddenly there was no war, and uh, you'd miss the camaraderie of your colleagues working out there. This was the greatest public health accomplishment to date. Yes, smallpox eliminated a disease from the world. That disease is no longer present. The smallpox campaign gave global health leaders the optimism that they could take on any disease as long as they had a vaccine and the warriors to get it out. But smallpox would turn out to be the only worldwide success. And even before the applause had ended, a devastating new virus, HIV AIDS, rose up to test global health and the power of vaccines as never before. Today, AIDS is on track to kill more people than smallpox, particularly in the disease's old breeding ground, Africa. Sex workers looking for clients in Nairobi, Kenya. It could be any street in any city in Africa. And it's one of the important ways the AIDS virus is spread. Clients of these sex workers become infected and take the disease back home to their families.
Charles Wachihi is a Nairobi doctor and an AIDS researcher. Over 80% of the patients admitted to every hospital have HIV-related complications, ranging from diarrhea to chest infections to meningitis. You have all these people coming in and out, coming in and out, and then they come in and never go out. AIDS has killed more than 20 million people, most here in Africa. This is a sad place to be at. Most of the people buried here are between the ages of 20 and 30 years. As a doctor, it does raise a lot of um, anxiety and uh, confusion in a, in, in a person, especially when most of the people who are dying are at the prime of their life. Charles Wachihi knows the despair of doctors unable to heal their patients. I had a friend in high school. He died when he was about 23 years old. He's a person you see, he's been sickly, he's getting weak, and then a year later he's in the newspaper, obituary. AIDS sufferers in the West can take powerful antiretroviral drugs that will keep the virus at bay. But in Africa, these medications are far too expensive for most Kenyans to afford. Ada Kadiga is an ordinary, hard-working woman who caught HIV from her husband, who died of AIDS. She used to get free drugs from the hospital where she had a job, but now she's too sick to work and hasn't the money to buy drugs on her own. Hi, Dr. Susan Sadenbar has the task of allocating scarce AIDS drugs to her patients. Okay, so money for you is a quite a struggle. A struggle. Mm -hmm. Do you have any plans to raise the money for so you'll be able to access the drugs? No. Mm -hmm. That is quite worrying. Mm -hmm. I cannot sleep because I'm worrying too much mm -hmm. how to keep the food on the table. Mm -hmm. I know that I'm now dying because I, I live by, by those drugs now. Yeah. So you'd actually drugs. feel now that is a death sentence yeah. you're going to die? Mm -hmm. If any disease needs a vaccine, it's AIDS. Africa is doomed without the vaccine. We have about 42 million infected throughout the world and over 75% in Africa alone. When AIDS first came on the scene two decades ago, I really expected three to five years we would have an effective vaccine. It's 20 years later and we still don't have a vaccine. Over the last two decades, researchers have learned that making a vaccine for HIV is extremely difficult because unlike other viruses, it destroys the immune system itself. When HIV enters the body, antibody proteins that try and block it can't attach themselves to the surface of the virus, so it's free to invade any cell it chooses. And it chooses helper T cells the source of the killer T cells that would normally fight any invading virus. So with no killer T cells or antibodies to stop HIV, the virus keeps reproducing and overwhelms the entire immune system. Scientists have always seen the destruction of the immune system as the main stumbling block to an HIV vaccine. In this vast Nairobi shanty town of 50,000 people, Researchers have made a remarkable discovery, which they hope will lead to a vaccine. They found a group of 200 sex workers here in Pamwani who are naturally immune to AIDS. Dr. Wachihi and his nurse Jean are part of an international team studying the AIDS-free prostitutes. One of them, Salome Simon, is starting her day. She's waiting for customers at the door of her house. By nightfall, she may have had 10 partners. Many will have HIV. Yet Salome has remained HIV free. I think I'm very lucky and I'm very happy because it's an astonishing way in which God has chosen me. While Salome is totally free of HIV, Jennifer Wabui, another sex worker, has had the virus for 10 years, yet hasn't developed full-blown AIDS. Charles Wachihi and his researchers want to know what protects Jennifer from AIDS, 
and could this information be used to make a vaccine? She is unique in that the immune system is constantly able to recognize HIV virus and continuously destroy it. A friend of mine, a woman who used to live with me, had AIDS and passed away. If I do get AIDS, that's my destiny. America's destiny may lie in understanding the special properties of Jennifer's blood. Halfway around the world, at Oxford University, another part of the research team has found that the Pumwani women possess an abnormally high number of killer T cells. This means their killer T cells haven't been destroyed by HIV. In fact, it's just the opposite. The prostitute's killer T cells can actually destroy HIV. They do this by targeting two HIV proteins that always move to the surface of an invaded cell. When this happens, that cell is destroyed, meaning the prostitute's immune system can defeat HIV. Researchers have now learned which genetic fragments of HIV produce these proteins and have begun to inject the fragments into volunteers. Okay. Although the fragments alone cannot cause AIDS, the team hopes that by putting them into a vaccine, they will spark the production of the exact kind of killer T cells that protect the Nairobi prostitutes. My reason for taking part was to try and help. Um, it's one small thing that I can do. Um, I can't go out there and, and, and help people in any other way. Um, but by having a few injections and having a few blood tests, then hopefully I can help to have an impact. At present, they're getting a positive response in 75% of the volunteers, an excellent test result. But no one knows if these vaccine-produced killer T cells will be able to stop a real HIV attack. If the initial trials continue to go well, the next stop will be the streets of Nairobi. 2,000 HIV negative sex workers and their clients will take the vaccine for two years to see if they can remain AIDS free. But it will take several more years to complete all the trials. And this vaccine, like others being tested, may ultimately end in failure. It's ironic that Nairobi sex workers like Jennifer who usually spread HIV, may someday prove instrumental in stopping it. Hi. But even if the vaccine is successful, it will come too late to save Ada Kadiga. She's now in a hospital, but without drugs and money, her hope has run out. In terms of the infection rates, the mortality rates, the cost of drugs, that means if we don't have a vaccine, we need actually this vaccine yesterday. We needed it yesterday. The great power of any vaccine is that it keeps people from getting sick in the first place. No hospitals, no expensive medicines, no fear that a horrible disease can strike at any moment. But for now, when it comes to AIDS, freedom from fear is only a dream. For another global scourge, polio, the battle is almost over. An effective vaccine has existed for decades, and the number of cases worldwide has fallen dramatically. But in Nigeria, the same religious resistance that has thwarted vaccinators in India has caused the vaccine to be banned here. In a country that once had only a few cases left, by 2004, there were more than 600 making Nigeria the largest reservoir of the disease in the world. During the ban, many children have come down with the disease, including 20-month-old Akasim Kasim. At first, he couldn't even move his head. His hands were not moving like now. And he couldn't move any part of his body. Akasim is crippled now for life, and his father is devastated. David Heyman, one of the original smallpox warriors, 
heads the polio eradication program at the World Health Organization in Geneva. With the virus now spreading from Nigeria to countries that had previously been polio free, Heyman and his team know the whole eradication program is in danger. What happened when Nigeria stopped immunizing is that one virus made its way to Chad, causing children to be paralyzed in Chad. Then from Chad, the virus went to Central African Republic in the south, the one in yellow. The virus from Chad also went to Sudan, and it caused an outbreak of polio in Sudan, which is still going on. 657 cases so far in Nigeria. Um, if you compare with other countries, basically 80% of the cases in the world are occurring in Nigeria. Yeah. To break the logjam in Nigeria, Heyman sought help from Islamic leaders who recommended sending the vaccine to a Muslim-run laboratory in Indonesia for analysis. We worked behind the scenes helping the country determine what steps they needed to take to prove that the vaccine was safe. When Indonesia reported the vaccine contained no harmful agents, Nigerian clerics opened the door for vaccinators from Rotary International and UNICEF, who immediately rushed serum to polio-affected areas. A child paralyzed because of the ban is paraded before Nigerian village elders as a warning for all to take polio drops. If they can control polio here, the vaccinators would stand a good chance of stopping the spread to other nations. Resistance to vaccines is not confined to poor countries or to religious objectives. This is Vashon Island off the west coast of America. In this exclusive island community, four miles from Seattle, some people claim equally good reasons for rejecting vaccines. I believe that my children's natural immunity to the disease is going to protect them much better than the vaccine. I am concerned about burdening their young bodies with too many challenges, immune system challenges at once. In truth, there is always a slight chance that any vaccine can produce an unwanted side effect. One of the original smallpox warriors, Bill Fagy, also lives on Vashon Island, but disagrees with the resistors. I believe what's happened now is that parents do not know what those diseases are like. And so they've lost the fear of the disease and it's harder for them to get the feeling that they're contributing to something when they can't see that disease anymore. Parents in this community are part of a growing trend to keep children unvaccinated out of fears, many unfounded, that vaccines may harm them. You know, there's mercury in vaccinations and that might have thrown off her immune system. The side effects are not worth that for, for my children at this time. There seems to be some side effects with whipping cough that weren't satisfied in my research. Who lives ultimately with the repercussions of the decision? This would be the parents. If this attitude from affluent Bashan Island had surfaced decades earlier, polio would never have been eradicated from the U.S. And this is precisely the problem that vaccinators now face in India as they struggle to defeat this crippling disease forever. We don't want the vaccines at all. You're giving us all these medicines that make the children weak. Are you God? Answer me. We only trust God. Allah keeps my child safe. Who are you to keep him safe? Back in India, polio vaccinators are still trying to win over the religious resistance. I can't read. What difference does it make? Why should a child suffer for someone else's mistakes? It's the will of Allah. But Allah has given us brains. What? It's up to Allah to decide. You're showing me a cartoon? Please trust me and look. Just because of one small mistake, that child walks like this? So they're trying to explain to the father that uh, you know, this is an important thing inherently. I think, so I, think we may have, uh, I think we may have cracked it. The persuasive powers of the vaccinators have finally won the day. Two precious drops of vaccine are given orally and an indelible mark put on the small finger acts as a record. One more child 
will never get polio. Months of door-to-door -door persuasion has seemingly brought resistance in northern India to an end. Vaccinators are now ready for October 10th, 2004, when the full campaign to vaccinate India's under fives will begin. And they will have to reach all the children, because with polio, you can never be sure who carries the disease and who doesn't. Smallpox eradication was easy compared to polio eradication. All people who were infected with the smallpox virus actually showed signs and symptoms. They had terrible blisters on their face. But polio remains hidden in the population, so two million vaccinators will have to find and vaccinate every child under five in just one or two days. Make sure everything's going back, keep them back. In Aligarh, Nason Saba and Dr. Sudip Singh are ready. Well, this is it. This is the big day, uh, the culmination of weeks of uh, concerted effort at all levels. With its overcrowding and pockets of resistance, Aligarh will be one of the most difficult assignments in India. And with thousands of children to reach, Nason knows the vaccinators have to get to their post quickly. If they've got their vaccine, they need to move out. It's past 8 o'clock, and the official start time of this thing is 8. By mid-morning, the campaign is in high gear. This is vaccination Indian style. A vast pageant of parades, rallies, and street theater. The goal is to get every child to one of the 350 vaccination stations that have been set up throughout the city. See the microphone. But behind the scenes, there are problems for Nason and Sudip to overcome, even at the very first vaccination station they visit. Did you have the names? The three yes. Namaskar, Unlike smallpox vaccine, Polio vaccine deteriorates quickly when it's taken from the ice packs. So heat-sensitive labels on the vials turn different warning colors as the fluid passes through four stages of deterioration. How many stages are there? Two. Two. Three. No, three. Huh? It's four. Is this what you call training, you shameless creature? Don't you feel ashamed? When were they last trained? She did not get trained in this round. She was last round. How about this gentleman? You haven't been to training, have you? No. Okay, that's okay. Can they... He didn't go. Don't tell me fairy tales. Why did you replace a team member without telling anyone? To keep the program on track here, Nason and Sudi have to replace these workers with a properly trained team. <laughs> Meanwhile, more and more join in the campaign. And there is good news. School children are bringing out their younger siblings for vaccination, just as they were asked to. There is a momentum building. But Nason and Sudi have to make sure everyone is doing their job correctly. The spread of disease by people on trains, first noted by the smallpox warriors, is no less real today. If vaccinators can't get to children on the move, the whole polio campaign will be lost. Yet this post is clearly missing scores of targets. They've only vaccinated 72 children over the entire morning. Sadiq, it's 72 kids, man. And there's more on the platform. There's 72 kids an hour here. We have more than 72 children on this platform alone. Don't you see how many children there are here? Sudeep, ask them how they're doing it. Wouldn't it be better to get a train? Are they boarding the train? Are they catching trains as they come in? We're not here just for fun. You've got to hop onto trains and ask people to get their kids vaccinated. So Sudeep boards a train and shows them how it should be done. 
इसको पोलियो दवाई पिलाई आपने योर चाइल्ड हैड पोलियो ड्रॉप्स इसको पोलियो दवाई पिलाई आपने कर रहा है लग रहा पता नहीं मजाक हो रहा है मैं लेडी आड़ी में रहता हूं और जाने हो क्या परेशानी हो रही है पिलाओ बेटे पिलाओ नहीं इसको पिलाओ छोटे बच्चे को By nightfall in Aligar, the rallies are still going strong. By morning, they will know just how successful their campaign has been. Where is the child map for this uh, village? It seems the vast majority in Aligar have indeed been vaccinated. But now an exhausted Nason and Sudip have to lead a smaller team to root out children who have missed their drops. One child in this house. House number 12. Two children here. Can we go check the houses? Sure. The only way to get to stragglers is to go house by house, checking the finger markings. It's a tedious process that will take a week. Are there any children under five? Here, the bagel wala ghar hai. The next house to yours. How many children under five live there? None. One. You saying there aren't any? None. Four little children. The map says there is one. How many? How many years old? We need to become the masters of information about all children under five. We're like the guardians, right? We should know better than anybody else in the village the condition, the welfare of the children under five. Alexa, बढ़िया बताओ ना चाहिए हमें पांच साल से छोटे बच्चों की यहाँ पे इस आप के तरफ. In the weeks and months that followed, there were no new cases of polio in Aligarh. And throughout India, fewer and fewer cases are appearing. X, so X means no children. No children. David Heyman, who runs the polio program for the WHO, visits rural Indian villages to see if isolated infections are still occurring. He goes to one town where polio had been rife. Does he think the child is regaining some strength? Is that right? So she's having physical therapy. Amen believes that the handful of paralyzed children he finds here could be the very last polio victims in India. I speak for all of the people working on polio eradication that when the last case of polio does occur, there will be a great satisfaction that, again, a disease has disappeared from the world. Have they taken? Have they had An exhausted Nason Sava echoes these sentiments. I think I'm going to feel a tremendous sense of pride when those last two drops of oral polio vaccine are delivered. Have all their brothers and sisters taken? Tell them to go out. It's their, it's their challenge. It's their challenge. All of their friends, under five. Here in India, the scourge of polio may finally be over. Though sadly, the Nigerian outbreak has spurred isolated cases in Africa and elsewhere. Getting to this point would never have happened without the hundreds of millions of parents all over the world who've had their own children vaccinated for polio. So when we give vaccines, it's both because we want to protect our children, but also because we have a social contract that in living in this society, we also try to protect other children. Vaccines are absolutely the foundation stone of public health. Vaccines are society's best protection against infectious disease. When we do not have them, we humans are vulnerable to the worst effects of virtually any infectious disease. But where they have worked, childhood death and disability has dropped dramatically and given all the world's people the chance for a longer and healthier life. Coming up next on RX for Survival. Penicillin and other antibiotics saved millions of lives and changed medicine forever. But now, some germs have developed resistance, and old diseases are making a deadly comeback. Times are changing. Bacteria is getting smarter and smarter. Can new drugs be developed before it's too late? Stay tuned for Rise of the Superbugs, part two of RX for Survival.
Major funding for RX for Survival was provided by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, working to ensure that life-saving advances in health reach those who need them most. And by... Measles is a game you play and then you sing a song. Mumps are something that camels have. Some have two mumps and some have one. Chicken Park is a park where chickens have fun. Most kids today don't have a clue about diseases adults remember, thanks to Merck scientists. We've invested billions to research heart disease and asthma. Now we're trying to make Alzheimer's, diabetes, and cancer history too. Merck, where patients come first. PBS will return in a moment. Uncover the mystery of the Black Death. Fear of the plague is an absolute fear. If you catch it, you'll die. But did those who survived pass on a legacy of resistance to HIV? Find out on Secrets of the Dead. 8 p.m. CBTV Wednesday. This week on Now. I wish I had known when I was in the White House what I know now about the Third World. A president speaks out. It's very difficult for the American people to believe that our government, one of the richest on earth, is also one of the stingiest on earth. Jimmy Carter on America and the Health of the World. Watch now, Friday at 8.30, here on CPTV. most beautiful stars bring you the world's most beautiful songs Celtic woman 7 p.m. CBTV Saturday then at 9 the London Times called them the greatest tribute show in the world them both CBTV Saturday. In a high security biosafety lab, researchers stare at the chilling results of recent tests. Deadly tuberculosis bacteria have managed to withstand almost every drug that can kill them. This means Strains of contagious airborne bacteria are mutating into superbugs that may soon be unstoppable. I was shocked because I had never seen tuberculosis resistant to 10 drugs. The samples come from Lima, Peru. An easy plane ride to cities like New York. Even more worrisome, they're from TB victims who are taking antibiotics that should be curing them. We were finding patient after patient just not doing well. And we felt certain that there was a big problem here. From the slums of the developing world to the richest cities on earth, diseases once easy to treat are becoming harder to cure. Times are changing. Ba bacteria is getting smarter and smarter. I'd never dream that I'd have one that I'd have to fight such a battle with. For decades, we've counted upon life-saving drugs to rescue us. But as the germs fight back, our medicines are failing. The situation is heading us towards a major public health disaster. A perfect microbial storm is brewing, and if we ignore it, 
we could be swept back to the era when microbes were invincible. Next, on RX for Survival, Rise of the Superbugs. Funding for RX for Survival was provided by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, working to ensure that life saving advances in health reach those who need them most. And by If you ran a drug company, what would you change? I would try to prevent disease, not just treat it. I would go after the really tough diseases. I'd make it so folks wouldn't have to choose between their groceries and their medicine. At Merck, we believe in the same things you do. Because 50 years ago, George Merck told us to put patients first by creating novel medicines and vaccines and getting them to the people who need them. I would try to see everything through the eyes of a patient. Merck, where patients come first. In rural Honduras, 10-month-old Stephen fights to breathe. To reach a doctor, his mother, Narada, walked for hours, carrying her feverish baby in her arms. She's told the violent shaking of his chest signals pneumonia, a dangerous bacterial infection. Fortunately, there are medicines that can cure this disease, antibiotics, but only if they're given in time. And Stephen has lost precious hours must be sent to a hospital to be put on a respirator. During the nerve-wracking four-hour journey, Narata prays the antibiotics being injected into Stephen will work. As the ambulance races, a nurse keeps him breathing with a hand pump. In the emergency ward, doctors struggled to get Stephen on the only available respirator in the country. As her son clings to life, Narata can only watch and hope. I'm so afraid to lose him. Before I brought him, on the day he turned worse, he said, Mama, for the first time, I would not like this to be his last time. Dr. Jorge Melendez has helped to stabilize Stephen. Now it's a waiting game. If Stephen had received antibiotics sooner, he would not be at the risk of death. Because pneumonia, when it's treated, as soon as the first symptoms arise, in most cases, is totally curable. As the days pass, Stephen's antibiotics finally beat back the infection. Exhausted, but over the crisis, he has survived an attack by one of our deadliest enemies, bacteria. These microscopic creatures have dominated the planet for over three billion years, and they can be found everywhere. They can live in boiling water, they can live in freezing temperatures, they can live in the center of solid rock, and in fact, if we look at our own bodies, we are basically walking bacteria. There are on the order of 10 to 100 trillion bacterial cells on and in us, every one of us. We could not live without bacteria. 
While most bacteria are useful, even helping to make the oxygen we breathe, some cause severe disease. For millennia, there were no medicines to stop their deadly assault. But with the dawn of the 20th century, a new war against microbes was about to begin. World War I. Battles are raging across Europe. And wherever the guns go, deadly bacterial infections follow close behind. Field hospital in France, Alexander Fleming, a young British doctor, is horrified by what he sees around him. Come on, we have no time. More soldiers die from the bacteria invading their open wounds than from bombs or bullets. Desperate for any solution, the medics try scouring the injuries with carbolic acid, a chemical antiseptic used to clean sewer pipes. Fleming! There it is. The septic will have to amputate it. Try using more carbolic acid. No, it doesn't work. It's double the strength. No, that doesn't work either. Sir, I don't think... It's an order, Fleming. But Fleming is right. Uh, nurse? The treatment is useless. And by the end of the war, bacterial infections will claim millions of lives. Strength. Alexander Fleming, a doctor without a cure, would return to London and dedicate his life to finding one. He begins by studying bacteria, determined to find chinks in their armor. Year after year, he gets nowhere. Then, one day in 1928, chance intervenes thanks to Fleming's sloppy housekeeping. <laughs> In a pile of Petri dishes he's forgotten to clean, he notices something unusual. A stray bit of mold has landed on a dish of deadly bacteria, and it's wiping them out. He looks into this dish, and he sees what turns out to be one of the great scientific discoveries ever. Here was a killer organism, Staphylococcus, terrible to human beings, dead, dead from something that a mold had produced. Fleming is clearly aware of the notion that life hinders life, the notion that one organism can eat another like a lion eats its prey in the jungle. Just like creatures in the visible world, microscopic life, like molds and bacteria, will fight each other for survival. In a moment of epiphany, Fleming realizes the mold is defending itself by secreting something that destroys the bacteria. The mysterious substance targets the cell walls, prohibiting the bacteria from dividing and producing more bacteria, so they quickly die off. Fleming calls his discovery penicillin, after the common mold penicillium, which is often found on rotting food. If he can isolate the bacteria-killing substance, he might have the weapon he's been searching for. And he would really spend the next two or three years trying to discern what it was in this mold that killed the bacteria. But he was not a chemist. Unable to extract the penicillin, Fleming finally gives up. But he publishes an article in an obscure journal and keeps the original mold alive, just in case. Had it not been for another world war, Fleming's discovery may have remained quietly hidden. But as World War II engulfs the globe, infections are again killing soldiers at an alarming rate. Searching for a cure, Oxford scientists Howard Florey and Ernst Chain discover Fleming's paper on penicillin and borrow his penicillium molds. They then set out to accomplish what Fleming could not. 
penicillin is the most elusive, unstable bit of medicine you could ever try to capture. It was this will-o'-the-wisp that would disappear. Finally, by altering the chemical state of molecules produced by the mold, they isolate small amounts of penicillin. It easily cures infections in mice. But will it work as well on humans? Their first patient is a dying policeman named Albert Alexander, who scratched his cheek in his rose garden. Imagine a time where just scratching your face on a rose thorn can lead you to be so eaten by bacteria. That's Albert Alexander. And the bacteria are eating through his body like worms eating an apple. And then he gets a shot of penicillin, one shot of penicillin that's not even particularly pure. And then this miraculous thing occurs. These bacteria, which have had their will with him, are suddenly at bay. Here, Chain and Flory and the others are thinking, this is a gigantic moment in medicine. We're going to cure this man from the brink of death. And then they ran out of penicillin. And he died that horrible death that he had nearly died a month before. Despite the tragedy, Flory and Chain are certain they found one of the holy grails of medicine, a drug to stop infections. But with British industry crippled by Nazi bombing, how will they ever produce enough of it? Flory turns to American companies for help, and they discover how to mass produce the drug by fermenting it like beer. Scientists are manufacturing this wonder drug in enormous quantities. The wonder drug proves itself a potent weapon, saving thousands of Allied soldiers' lives. Until the Second World War, there wasn't a lot that could actually be done for people. And the discovery of penicillin led to a great opening of the era of medicines. The realization that a simple mold could produce an effective drug inspire scientists to search for other organisms that might do the same. New medicines derived from molds, funguses, and even bacteria flood the market. Tetracycline, cephalosporin, erythromycin, antibiotics. called antibiotics, meaning against life, these miracle drugs can stop infections like pneumonia, gangrene, and meningitis. Even the most widespread bacterial disease of all, tuberculosis, is finally curable with antibiotics. In the epic war against microbes, it looks as if humanity has finally won. But just a few decades later, a disturbing trend shadows the world. Infectious microbes are staging a comeback. In Lima, Peru, 29-year-old Raquel wonders why she is still suffering from tuberculosis. For years, she's been taking antibiotics, but she remains highly infectious, and her lungs are weak and battered. None of my friends know that I have TB because I'm afraid that they will say, just go away. I feel that if I am rejected, I won't be able to bear the pain, so I would rather not see them. Raquel is used to rejection. Her husband left to avoid getting sick. Now, she and her son Bruno must depend on her elderly mother and their future looks bleak. Nearby, Julia Giuseppe has also battled TB for years. Tests reveal her children are infected as well, but they haven't developed active disease. In fact, 
One third of the world's population now carries the TB bacillus in their bodies, like a time bomb waiting to go off. 10% of those people, about 200 million, before they die, will develop the active form of tuberculosis. The fact is, there are more people now infected with tuberculosis than at any other time in human history. Fueling the rise of TB are the millions of people now infected with HIV AIDS, whose weakened immune systems make them vulnerable. But that's not the only reason the disease plagues countries like Peru. In Lima, TB thrives in shanty towns like Caraballo, where tiny shacks cling to any patch of unclaimed rocky hillside. With impoverished families crammed into tight quarters, it's the perfect breeding ground for TB bacteria that pass through the air from victim to victim. Because the bacteria are constantly evolving, Patients like Julia must take multiple drugs for months. And following the regimen is critical. As the drugs start killing the germs, many people begin to feel better and stop taking their pills. But a few germs are naturally resistant to the antibiotics. These survive, quickly multiply, and become the majority. Now. If patients restart their medicines, these resistant bacteria become tougher to kill. Because this was happening in Peru, in 1991, the government set up a program called DOTS for directly observed therapy. The premise is, if nurses make sure patients swallow all their antibiotics every day for six months, they will always be cured. And this was the fortunate outcome for most TB victims. But not all. In Caraballo, the crosses of people dying from TB began creeping up the mountainside as steadily as the squatter settlement itself. In 1995, the situation puzzles two doctors, Paul Farmer and Jim Kim working in Caraballo through their nonprofit group, Partners in Health. Peru had the best TB program in the world, and yet we were finding patient after patient after patient still suffering from tuberculosis. And we felt certain that there was a big problem here. To find out why patients in a model program are not getting better, Kim and Farmer send Peruvian colleague Jaime Bayona into the clinics to investigate. I asked the nurses if they knew of people that were sick with TB, that went every day to the health center to take pills, but were never healed. And the answer was, yeah, we have a lot of cases like that. Since medical records are confidential, Jaime reads the files upside down, searching for the telltale R's indicating patients whose TB is resistant to their medicines. I was shocked because the usual way of explaining drug resistance is, well, the patients aren't taking their meds, and these patients had been compliant, and we had written documentation of their therapy. We then started asking some hard questions, and we asked the physicians, what's going on with these patients? Don't you think they have drug resistance? And the answer was a pretty stock one. No, there's no problem of drug resistance. DOTS is curing everybody. It's not an issue, it's not an issue, it's not an issue. Kim and Farmer are skeptical, but to prove otherwise, they will need lab tests. In 1995, they send the bacterial samples from several Caraballo patients to a state lab in Massachusetts. The results are chilling. Most samples are resistant not to one, but to all five antibiotics normally used to treat TB. 
As Kim and Farmer suspected, it was not the patients that were the problem, but dangerous strains of multi-drug resistant, or MDR-TB. That is why Raquel is not getting better. The DOTS drugs are useless against her highly resistant TB. Now more than ever, she fears infecting her son Bruno. But all she can do is try not to breathe on him. My son wants to play with me and kiss me. And he does not understand what's going on. He thinks that I am mean, that I don't love him. But I always tell him that I am sick, that I can infect him. And he says, it doesn't matter, you can. It doesn't matter if you're contagious. Although she fears spreading the disease, there are days when Raquel has to go to the market. Everyone around her is at risk. It's really a crisis. It's not as if these patients with active MDRTB were being put in sanatoria. They weren't being removed from the community. They were right there, were sick with an infectious disease in a big crowded city. If the epidemic isn't stopped, it will spread beyond the city or even the continent. Worse, these deadly strains could easily become untreatable. The notion that you could be sitting on an airplane, even if you're in first class, and become infected with a disease that could kill you and that modern medicine could do nothing about uh, is very frightening. Kim and Farmer believe the MDRTB patients can be cured, but they will have to convince Peru to provide entirely new drugs and more aggressive treatment. And we went to the authorities and said, we'd like to start treating these patients. And at first, they said, you will not treat these patients. And we said, not treat the patients. We, could, we just couldn't understand why. In fact, it was much worse than that. They said, if you start treating the patients, we'll look at your papers and we'll kick you out of the country. The problem is, the few drugs that cure MDR-TB are highly toxic and cause dangerous side effects. Rarely used, they are so expensive, the Peruvian government can't afford them. The price of treating MDR patients was so high, it was impossible for us. It was not only an economic problem, the treatment was too complex and difficult to manage. We couldn't justify the investment. Even the World Health Organization agrees. In the 1990s, the official policy around the globe is to treat those with curable TB and let MDR victims die. And we thought, but that's not public health. That's sort of like public death. And I said to Paul, it's really important that we do this because if we show that we can treat drug-resistant TB, we would make the case that these complex health problems for poor people are things that we're just going to have to deal with. You've got to treat people with MDR-TB to prevent it from spreading to others. With the authorities ignoring the growing threat, in 1996, Partners in Health sets out to cure a small group of patients on its own. These are people who have already been told there's nothing that can be done for you. And it was really sort of their last chance. Muy Not sort of, why qualify it? This was really the last chance for people who were sick with these highly resistant strains. But each drug-resistant patient will need between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars worth of medicine. Until they can raise the money, Farmer and Kim adopt a Robin Hood approach, borrowing the antibiotics from their hospital in Boston. With lives on the line and time running out, Kim packs his suitcase and hopes he won't be stopped by customs. 
There's a lot of red tape in moving medications around anywhere. And across international borders, there's a lot more. We couldn't figure out a better way to do it other than just to carry the drugs by hand. People who looked Peruvian always got stopped and had their bags checked. I could pass myself off as a Japanese tourist, and uh, generally they treated us a little bit better. But can partners in health keep medicines flowing to patients this way? And will victims actually get better? It's a huge gamble. The only thing sure is time is running out and the epidemic is spreading. Unfortunately, Peru is not the only country plagued by drug resistance. 2,000 miles away in Seattle, Washington, time is also running out for Ryan Wirth, who has a drug-resistant infection that's getting worse. I'm very scared. Thought I'd never dreamed that I'd have the bacteria to have to fight such a battle with. Ryan's struggle began six months ago during kidney dialysis, when the procedure led to an infection in his abdomen. He's taken one antibiotic after another without success. He did have some resistance to the antibiotics, and we tried basically everything we knew was available. It just hasn't been working. Ryan's infection is caused by a common bacterium found in soil. It's not usually dangerous, but like TB in Peru, this strain has mutated into a superbug. Well, they pretty much described a superbug to me as a, a bacteria that's just stubborn. It's resistant to a lot of different antibiotics that they have available. As the bacteria continue to multiply, Ryan is running out of options. Today, his surgeon, Dr. Raker, will try to cut the infection out. Here is the abscess itself. It should not be there. And we're hoping to completely excise the infected area. Resorting to the knife to save patients' lives was routine before the discovery of antibiotics. But Ryan's doctors know this is the only hope for keeping his infection from spreading to the rest of his body. You see, the abscess is in my hand now. I've got it. We were really pleased that we could get around it, and uh, I think we got all of it out, all the gross contamination out. Although the operation seems successful, if a single microbe remains in Ryan's body, it could reinfect him. With Ryan's life still on the line, Dr. Schwartz wants him to try an experimental antibiotic. Called tigacycline, it's only available for the most desperate patients. You don't know if you want to be a guinea pig. It almost gets to the point where you got to choose, take the test medicine or die. Um, they're getting the drug ready to give you now. Do you have any other questions we didn't have a chance to talk about? I'm scared that um, this option won't work. That the microbi that the uh, microbacteria will win. As the golden-colored drug flows towards Ryan's veins. He has no idea if his body will tolerate the experimental medicine. It will be months before he knows if he's cured. Times are changing. Bacteria is getting smarter and smarter. It's adapting to all the medications, the, the antibiotics that people are taking. There needs to be more of them available.
As Ryan has learned, after an explosion of antibiotics discovered in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the faucet is running dry. Of the hundreds of drugs currently under government review, only a handful are for bacterial infections. And that's bad news for the public. You know, in fact, I think they should be terrified. It's taken us 12 years to get tigacycline anywhere near the market. This makes these drugs commercially unsuccessful, and it really discourages other people from going into the field. So we've got to make the process simpler, faster, because drugs don't come cheap. It can easily cost over a half a billion dollars to develop a new drug. Since antibiotics are taken infrequently, they are far less profitable than the drugs people need every day. Pills that manage cholesterol, high blood pressure, depression, or even libido. And that's why most pharmaceutical companies are getting out of the antibiotic business. One has to balance their risks in this industry. Where are you going to invest your money? And, you know, it sounds crass, but the fact is, um, if we were to stay in business by trying to find drugs that would lose us money every time we develop them, we wouldn't be able to find any drugs. Not only are antibiotics less profitable, miracle microbes are getting harder to find. But not everyone has given up the search. One pharmaceutical company has been spurred by the revelation that 99% of the microorganisms living beneath our feet have yet to be identified. We may be literally walking on microbes that can save lives. Microbes are masters at producing antibiotics in order to compete for their niche in the environment. So there's microbial warfare ongoing in every gram of soil every day, all the time. And some of those antibiotics have not been discovered yet. So when I look at a gram of dirt, what I see is undiscovered potential. In a single gram of soil, there are nearly 10,000 species of microorganisms unknown to science. But how do you find even one that can make the next great antibiotic? Cubist has a surprising approach. They've engineered an E. coli bacterium, commonly found in our gut, to resist all commercial antibiotics. The goal is to see if any living thing in the soil can kill this ultimate superbug. Each day, a liquid containing the E. coli is poured over microbes growing in culture. Across the surface of the plate, a battle for survival begins. In the next few days, if a clear spot radiates out from a spore of soil, this means the drug-resistant E. coli has met its microbial match. When we find a microbe that can produce an antibiotic that kills our E. coli, we know we have something unique because this E. coli is tough. Anything that kills it could be the next wonderful super drug. Cubist has found several promising leads, but research on any drug can take over a decade. For every 5,000 compounds tested, only one will become a medicine. 99% of what we do in drug discovery fails, and it fails every day. Part of the reason is that a lot of things look good in the lab. Even peppermint extract will kill HIV in the test tube. But taking something from the test tube into the human body is a whole different order of complexity. Meanwhile, for more and more patients like Ryan, the crisis is getting worse. And the horrifying thing is that every day in the front lines of these hospitals, we're encountering bacteria that we can't kill with our current antibiotics. We're just running out of weapons to use against them. The situation is heading us towards a major public health disaster. 
it is like watching the airplanes heading towards the World Trade Center with our hands tied. Perhaps the most alarming threat is from common Staph aureus. Ironically, it's the same bacteria that penicillin killed in Alexander Fleming's Petri dish. Now new multidrug resistant strains, known as MRSA, can thwart almost every antibiotic, catching even the strongest and healthiest among us off guard. Football players are extremely vulnerable, crashing into each other and opening scrapes and cuts that could let MRSA bacteria enter their bloodstreams. These are drug-resistant staph infections that are arising in everyday, healthy, in this case, robust athletes who are contracting this just as a matter of doing their jobs. That's pretty scary that you can get a drug-resistant infection just by playing the game of football. This is what happened to Ricky Linetti, star football player, number 19, at Lycoming College. Ricky scored touchdowns in every conceivable manner, catching 16 passes in one game. His team was headed to the championship playoffs when he got ill days before the big game. He told his mother he didn't have time to get sick. Ricky thought he had a stomach virus. That's what he thought he had. Then, you know, he thought maybe it was coming down with the flu. But when I saw him, I was scared to death. I mean, he couldn't walk. At 7.30 a.m., Ricky was admitted to the Williamsport Hospital. Although he was rushed to intensive care, he didn't seem to realize how sick he was. Ricky was an elite athlete. And so when he came in, even though he was breathing at 40 times a minute, he denied that he was short of breath. He said, I'm not short of breath, I'm fine. But just one look at him told us that he was in trouble. Ricky was given a massive infusion of fluid and medicine to stabilize his blood pressure. Despite a battery of tests, his diagnosis remained unclear. But fearing an infection, his doctors gave him multiple antibiotics, hoping one would work. I was told that something is attacking his body. We don't know what it is right now, but we're trying to find out. But the whole time I was just thinking, he's Ricky Linetti. Ain't no bug's gonna kill him. Not a bug, not something that he can't see. They had a heart specialist, the critical care specialist, the kidney specialist, a lung specialist, and then finally at one point they did say, we can't handle this. We can't handle it, he's too sick. Ricky's kidneys had failed, his liver had failed, his circulation was collapsing. It felt to me like I had a pile of sand in my hands and it was just slipping through my fingers. Just one week after winning his ninth football game of the season, Ricky Linetti was dead. Lab tests revealed he was stricken by the same strain of MRSA, hospitalizing athletes across the country. Although he was given one antibiotic that could have killed this strain, Ricky was too far gone for the drug to save him. This case was a real wake-up call in the sense that Ricky was in as good a shape as anybody could be in. He was 21 years old, the prime of his life, and yet he could not fight off this organism. If he can get it, anyone can get it. Ricky's father now spends hours surfing the web, learning about other MRSA cases. MRSA, more deaths than on the roads. Now, at first, I did see a lot of articles where people had abscesses that required surgeries, that required uh, amputations, but these people didn't die from it. Now people are dying from it. Doctors and hospitals are telling people to wash their hands, don't share towels. That's fine. It 
doesn't satisfy me. What would satisfy me would be like any other kind of disease you may get, that you'd be able to take something after the fact to kill it. While a few antibiotics can still stop this superbug, even they are beginning to encounter resistance. We need to remove the economic disincentives that exist to work on antibiotics because these drugs save lives immediately. They're obviously critically important to us as a society. Back in Peru, the dire need for new antibiotics is starkly apparent. Despite the growing epidemic, not a single new TB drug has been developed in 30 years. Working on a shoestring budget, Paul Farmer and Jim Kim are still trying to cure their small group of patients with drug-resistant TB. With medicines brought in from Boston, they've designed cocktails of rare drugs that each patient must take for two entire years. It's a daunting challenge. When you're sick with tuberculosis, caused by a strain like this, a very resistant strain, you have one shot. And it should be very aggressive. Lots of drugs, high doses, never miss a dose, because you know the, the microbe can hang out and then resurface later. To manage the side effects and make sure every pill is swallowed, Partners in Health hires and trains workers from the community. But many fear visiting highly contagious patients in their homes. They asked us questions like, well, you're asking us to take care of these patients and we're scared. Aren't you scared? And I'll never forget the answer that Paul gave was, yeah, I'm scared. Everyone's scared. But look, it's in the community, and the only way to deal with this is to take it head on. One nurse willing to take the risk is Lorena Mastava. Although it's dangerous, she chooses not to wear a protective mask so patients like Raquel won't feel stigmatized. It's not that the masks are physically uncomfortable, but it's like speaking to patients through a window. I want to be close to them, so the mask is like a barrier. For Lorena, winning a patient's trust is crucial especially when she must convince them to take medicines that cause horrible side effects. One of Lorena's toughest cases is Antonio. As he struggled to work his way through school, he became infected. At age 21, he weighs only 66 pounds. For 12 months, Lorena has been treating Antonio with six different drugs. The pills are hurting me. It's getting worse. Antonio is having a lot of stomach problems because of the drugs. He struggles with nausea, as well as fatigue, depression, and joint pains. Those early uh, months were the most difficult, because here we were giving treatment that no one had heard of with drugs that no one had heard of. And um, while they were getting better in some ways, they were also really sick with side effects. So we had to go and stand by them and, and convince them, please, you need to continue taking your medicines, because if you don't, you're going to die. Yes. A ver.
As Partners in Health urges patients to stick to the treatment, they still don't know if the two-year experiment will actually work. I think that we all had doubts. Privately, we're thinking, oh my god, this is so hard to get the medicines, to get the patients to think about their nutritional issues, the side effects, but it was a nightmare. Every day we had doubts. One of the biggest headaches is keeping up with the demand for medicines. Jim Kim must carry the drugs by hand into Peru. If he stopped, patients could miss doses, more resistance could develop, and their treatment would fail. On most trips, Kim breezes past customs officials without having his bag searched. But one day, the inspectors are curious. So I opened these suitcases with incredible dread. They saw that they were medicines, and I had my little piece of paper that said, this is a donation from Harvard Medical School. But of course, anything that looks slightly suspicious, they just take everything. This time, Kim talks his way out. But his Robin Hood approach is reaching its limits. Partners in Health must find a new way to get medicines. But first, they have to wait for lab results to prove that the drugs are actually working. For one patient, the signs are not good. Despite new drugs, x-rays reveal that TB still consumes Raquel's lungs. There is no improvement in my condition. I don't know why. Maybe I'm too resistant. I've been told to stop taking my medications because they no longer have any effect on me. I don't know what drugs I'm going to receive next. It turns out that Raquel is carrying a strain of bacteria resistant to virtually all TB drugs. But she appears to be in the minority. Tests confirm that Antonio is no longer infectious. If he can endure his antibiotics for a few more months, he will be totally cured. Julia is also disease-free after battling TB for years. As more positive results pour in, Partners in Health's huge gamble pays off. From a group of patients considered incurable, 85% are disease-free. No one had believed they could do it. Now, foundations and companies begin to donate drugs, legitimately. Partners' dramatic success would have a global impact. Instead of letting multi-drug resistant patients die, the World Health Organization now recommends a treatment plan modeled on Peru. Unfortunately, worldwide funding for such programs has fallen short. Of the estimated half million victims with multi-drug resistant TB, only a fraction is being treated correctly. As a result, the disease is spreading. Multi-drug resistant tuberculosis is dangerous, scary, and a huge public health threat. So that if we don't take the steps for all of us to work together and the wealthier nations helping the poorer nations, all of us are going to become ill. For Jim Kim, it makes economic sense to act quickly. If you don't treat it now, and if you don't spend the money now, you're gonna spend much, much more money later. And this is true for all infectious diseases. MDRTB is part of the larger problem, the crisis of drug resistance. And you just go down the list of the big killers, 
malaria, AIDS, tuberculosis, bacterial infections that take lives in hospitals. Drug resistance is already a huge problem. So all of our best drugs could be obsolete with each of these diseases. We should be thinking ahead. The specter of totally drug-resistant infections now haunts the world. With no antibiotics to save her, Raquel passed away. Her son Bruno has also tested positive for TB. In Seattle, Ryan has been luckier. His bacteria has been defeated by the experimental drug, one of the only new antibiotics coming down the pipeline. But as time goes by, success stories like Ryan's may be increasingly rare. We're just heading right back into the past with lack of antibiotics. And it's very scary to think about it, that up to 10, 20 years from now, we may not have the tools to fight these infections. Then what? It's preposterous to think we could ever, quote unquote, win the war against microbes. This is not a war, it's a holding action. What we want to do is keep one step ahead of them. The medicines that saved Stephen in Honduras or Antonio in Peru could soon lose their power, leaving all of us vulnerable to once curable diseases. To ensure a safer future, we need to find better ways to control these threats because the bugs will never go away. Next time on Rx for Survival. Sometimes the hardest part of healthcare is getting to the patient. We know how to prevent infectious diseases, but it doesn't do a bit of good unless it gets to the people. And in the modern world, disease can travel on wings, large and small. They outnumber us, and they've been at the survival game a lot longer than the human population. Rx for Survival continues only on PBS. Learn more about global health, then find out how you can make a difference at pbs.org. To order Rx for Survival on DVD or VHS or the companion book to the series, please call 1-800-255-9424. Major funding for Rx for Survival was provided by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, working to ensure that life-saving advances in health reach those who need them most. And by... Measles is a game you play and then you sing a song. Mumps are something that camels have. Some have two mumps and some have one. Chicken pock is a park where chickens have fun. Most kids today don't have a clue about diseases adults remember, thanks to Merck scientists. We've invested billions to research heart disease and asthma. Now we're trying to make Alzheimer's, diabetes, and cancer history, too. Merck, where patients come first. We are 
PBS. Uncover the mystery of the Black Death. Fear of the plague is an absolute fear. If you catch it, you'll die. But did those who survived pass on a legacy of resistance to HIV? Find out on Secrets of the Dead. 8 p.m. CBTV Wednesday. The next epidemic could be a plane ride away. That's why PBS is bringing you a major new health and education initiative. A groundbreaking effort to make the world a healthier place for all of us. Watch Rx for Survival. 9 p.m. CBTV Wednesday. This week on Now. I wish I had known when I was in the White House what I know now about the Third World. A president speaks out. It's very difficult for the American people to believe that our government, one of the richest on Earth, is also one of the stingiest on Earth. Jimmy Carter on America and the Health of the World. Watch now, Friday at 8.30, here on CPTV. Happy childhoods don't just happen. Whether they are good ones depends on you. A hug a kiss and having that parent with you is going to last forever. They were actually there when I most needed them. If not for them, I would say that I wouldn't be who I am today. This message is brought to you by CPTV, Connecticut Voices for Children, and the Connecticut Youth Opportunities Initiative. There's a lot we know about the dangers of teen driving. Experts say that one out of five 16-year-olds crash during their first year of driving. And nearly 6,000 teens die in those crashes each year. Funding for Teens Behind the Wheel is made possible by St. Paul Travelers, a company dedicated to improving personal safety at home, at work, and on the road. CBTV Saturday. Ireland's most beautiful stars bring you the world's most beautiful songs. Celtic Woman. 7 p.m. CBTV Saturday, then at 9. The London Times called them the greatest tribute show in the world. Australian Pink Floyd show. Watch them both. CBTV Saturday. PBS programs stand out again with 10 primetime Emmys that separate the best from the rest. Honoring unforgivable blackness, great performances, live from Lincoln Center, Broadway, the American musical, and Masterpiece Theater's Lost Prince, this year's winner for outstanding miniseries, Year after year, more powerful programs. Congratulations to all the winners. Is your company ready for prime time? Join CPTV's UConn Women's Basketball Broadcast, the highest rated public broadcasting program in the nation. Our loyal fans have made UConn on CPTV a must-see, turning to us for college sports broadcasting's most ambitious schedule. UConn basketball is number one among Connecticut fans, and you will be too. Don't sit on the sidelines, get in the game. For information, call 860-275-7202. Hi, I'm André Rieu. Although I've been warmly received by audiences all over the world, I've specially enjoyed performing for you, my friends in Connecticut. Come, be a part of my next concert in May at the Chevrolet Theater in Wallingford. My good friends at CPTV have your ticket. Call toll-free 1-800-683-2112 for Andre Ryu's May 23rd concert. I look forward to seeing you. The CPTV shows you rely on are supported by our members and the following.
Connecticut Magazine is proud to support CPTV. The November issue features cozy New England country inns and a truly Connecticut Thanksgiving dinner. And look in the back for what's on CPTV, including RX for Survival, a global health challenge, and the start of Yukon women's basketball. Connecticut Magazine, it's the magazine Connecticut lives by.